I would love to see the professor of Dr. Tim Knox very much because three years ago my journey started with low carb high fat. I'm a sports nutritionist in Turkey and when I see the Real Meal Revolution book and I was amazed and everything changed. I'm a physician that's currently working in Dubai. I love the high fat low carb diet. We've, I've used it probably for 10 years in practice and I'm hoping to collaborate with Tim and um, have him as part of our scientific advisory board. It's been really nice seeing the growth of the Nox Foundation and seeing doctors who are speaking about it more freely. Just to get the confirmation that to continue to promote um, low carb living um, uh, as I've been doing for the past few years in my practice. Quite a lot of chronic health disease in, in the practice and that's where I start working was from in nutrition and, and diet. With the experience that I've had with my patients, um, it's positive. And I felt I wanted to learn more and become more confident in uh, the facts and the information about uh, low carb so that I could share it with uh, my clients and with my patients. I see my practice is uh, people are really conforming to uh, going on a diet and, and, and doing it the right way. And just the uh, factors that undermine them to do that, to, to just see what, what the things are that, uh, that prevent people from uh, going all out for it. Prof Noakes' introduction talk, it was amazing. Um, I think he is just awesome, has a wealth of knowledge and every slide, every sentence was just something you wanted to gulp up. I was too scared to blink. Listening to Professor Noakes talk on day one, it was just inspirational and gave the room so much energy. It's a very auspicious day because two days ago, a publication came out to prove that we are right. Uh, <laughs> and it was from Verta Health in California and they compared the outcomes to usual care and the group with usual care just got worse. The, the, the major outcome was that 93% of patients could either stop taking insulin or reduce the insulin. I was becoming quite concerned about the number of diabetes patients I, I saw. But in fact, in the Western Cape, they're now saying that diabetes is the number one killer, which is really staggering. You literally see this, this increase in mortality around sort of 30, 35, when you're combining TB, HIV, and diabetes. What shocked me was that there were more people under the age of 65 dying than over the age of 65. This is the number of new cases coming into the public health sector every month. Imagine that. I mean, it was up to 10. It's now hitting nearly 18,000 patients. Economically, this is going to cripple us. The families that we see often have diabetes through the generations. So they they've become desensitized to it. I should begin uh, by paying tribute uh, to my father. And sorry, I always get emotional. Um, this should really be the R.A. Noakes uh, Foundation. That's my father. And I graduated with MD, that was 1981. And he'd just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And 10 years later, he was, he was dead. And, and there I was watching him die and being party, part to the usual care that killed him. Now the point is that he was 68 and I'm 68 and I've been diagnosed type 2 diabetes for seven years and he was dead 10 years after the diagnosis. So I'm seven years into the diagnosis, so where, what's my future? Am I gonna be dead in three years time? So, so that's what drives me. I do have a bias, uh, an agenda if you like, and my agenda is uh, truth, scientific truth like um, one of my heroes, Professor Noakes. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Hippocrates said that um, in the original Hippocratic Oath. Um, just to highlight how very important food was and always will be. And then along comes this disaster, the 1977 Dietary Guidelines. And it took me a long time to understand where humans are on this chain and why diabetes is so prevalent. And it's, it's all on this slide. In South Africa, 19 million obese or overweight patients, almost 50% now in 2016. You can see for, for millions of years, we, we ate a low carbohydrate diet and then something changed. And that's how quick the change in carbohydrate consumption has been.
Professor Noakes is not really a maverick. Um, he's just a scientist searching for the truth. Uh, and he's done what any good scientist does when, when faced with compelling evidence that flatly contradicts a deeply held belief. Mike van der Nest, our, our advocate, essentially summarised what the trial was all about. It was a persecution. How a simple tweet could inspire uh, ADSA, who laid the charge, and the HPCSA to take all of its resources, 12 million rand of the doctor's money, and to point that at one person's direction. It raises a number of questions, one of which is, what's at stake? But that's not a, that's not a question to be answered. You know, when I was doing my course, I was gobsmacked at the idea that you have to treat diabetes patients with, with high carbs and low fat. <laughs> And yet, they could tell us very categorically that carbohydrates increase your glucose levels. It's not about trying to control the carbohydrates, it's about trying to match the medicine to the carbohydrates. That's the carbohydrate counting, that's the, the current philosophy. And that's what we're actually up against. Diabetes, it's the new norm. So we're surrounded by fat diabetic people. Um, when you're measuring yourself against other people and everybody is fat, you don't, see, you don't seem so fat. Whatever we've got our mums doing, we have the children following. Um, and this is where I'm passionate. So in my practice, I seem to, uh, tend to work a lot with teenagers. Um, and I see two extremes um, from what quite a big girls, which are usually fatter than their moms, which is, is quite interesting, and carrying their weight the way uh, a lot of their grandmothers are carrying it who are going through menopause. And that's, in my view, because of carbohydrate-induced hyperphagia. You eat more when you eat carbohydrates. And the evidence is in the literature that carbohydrates make you hungry. We could see the usual management of obesity as more of a symptomatic management. And if you're managing only the symptoms, as medication often does in most diseases, then how can you expect a long-term resolution of the, uh, the prom problem because you're not addressing the cause? The conventional medical model is looking in the disease for the cause of disease. And I'm suggesting that maybe the cause of disease is at the level of energy information. So in the pediatric pop population, the success rates are very, very well described. 50% of children who go on the diet have a greater than or equal to 50% reduction in seizures. The quickest response we had at Sydney Kids was in one day, going from seizures to no seizures at all. Jamie Smith is our lead researcher on our biggest RCT that we're very proud of being able to fund or co-fund with the NRF. Um, and it came very much from a dream to better fund proper research into human health and diet and nutrition, but particularly within the LZHF category. What was interesting is that uh, seven of the participants that when, when they started LCHF, they, they were diabetic. And then at the time that we tested them, um, they, went, they did not test positive for diabetes and they'd, they'd stopped uh, all their medication. So carb-based diets make us metabolically inflexible. But if you're able to burn fat in preference to carbohydrates, you can become much, much more metabolically flexible and flick between energy sources. So the, if there's no evidence that this model is correct, what is the role of cholesterol-lowering statin drugs in the management of prevention of coronary artery disease? If cholesterol is not causing heart disease, why are we taking statins and what's the evidence? So patients who survive through middle age seem no longer to be at substantially increased risk of coronary heart disease. So it completely disproves the hypothesis that cholesterol is damaging the arteries. So I talk to people about when they are connected to their body and they're mindful, I say to them, how does it feel to be in the 1% of people that are truly blessed to understand what food is doing to your body? Never, ever underestimate the power of one. It took Prof, one man, to stand up and start this revolution. Each one of us has the ability to speak and live our truth. Right now in Turkey, we are touching people's life. We are reversing type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome of insulin resistance. So it's also an honor to be here. Wow, I've learned a lot. Um, I'm a dietitian doing the ketogenic diet in Pretoria. This was amazing, amazing experience. And I would recommend it to anybody. But this was major to have proper, proper banding food at a conference. As a dietitian, I've found it so helpful to be around people who have the same plan in mind to help those, especially with diabetes. I'm hoping that this will encourage 
other practitioners just to start having more of an open mind. It's been the best conference that I've been at of this type and I can't wait till the next one.